one, which was supposed to be our morning panel, but is turning into our lunch panel here. Um, this panel will be moderated by Professor Stuart Benjamin, who is the Douglas B. Maggs Chair in Law and the Associate Dean for Research here at Duke Law School. Uh, before he began teaching law, Professor Benjamin clerked for Ninth Circuit Judge William C. Canby and for Justice David Souter. Uh, he's also worked in the Office of Legal Counsel at DOJ and worked as an associate with Professor Larry Tribe. I will turn it over to Professor Benjamin here to introduce our three panelists, and uh, this should, should be a great uh, morning-afternoon panel. Thank you. Uh, great. So thanks, everybody. Uh, so I will tell you, I'm, I maximize my own um, happiness by running a, a fairly tight time ship. So I will actually have these pieces of paper, and I will be, I will be keeping them to, uh, to to ten minutes each. Let me just briefly introduce you. Have the their you have their their great um, credentials. So I won't I won't spend a whole lot of time um, laying laying that out. I will note that um, in particular between uh, Jennifer and Peter, we have. I think most of the departments at Duke represented here, which is really kind of um, r remarkable. Um, and, um, and, then, and then Carol brings the, pretty much all of the DC metropolitan area uh, with her as well. So between the three of them, we've got sort of some major, so, some major power players. Um, all right, so um, I assume you all want to go in the uh, order that we have, which is alphabetical also because of the paper. So without, and, and, oh, by the way, so obviously enough, when you have one minute, you'll get this, and, and everybody knows what that means. Now, I will be sitting. what that order is? That's Pardon me? What's that order? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I think it's alphabetical. Alphabetical order. Oh, sorry. OK. OK, yes, sorry. Yes, 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 yes. Um, so without any further ado, um, Carol, please take it away. OK. Um, well, thank you, and thanks to Katie for organ the whole team for organizing such a, a really a interesting conference, um, certainly for me, coming from a completely different perspective. So. That's why I wanted to start by noting I do come from the kind of blunt tooled perspective of economists rather than the more refined conceptual approach of lawyers. And um, I notice even just doing the reading, uh, reading the papers, how much more time lawyers take to um, unbundle conceptual definitions into statements that can pass legal argument. Um, and I guess economists worry a lot more about translating questions of inquiry into equations, which when run on empirical data, can produce statistical regularities that we then try and interpret. So the, and I think that's probably why the happiness literature evolved the way it has, which was sort of from very blunt tooled usage of open-ended happiness surveys to now m many more refined questions, because as we got some answers, they raised as many questions as they'd answered, and we started refining the metrics as we went. Um, and I guess I've been at this for a long time. But um, I have to say, because even though these two approaches are really different, um, I think there's a lot of benefit to be gained from the professions talking more to each other, uh, at least in this area. Um, and I really benefited from the papers. That said, I think before we can really talk about or think about sound legal argument for utilizing these metrics and the related concepts that they invoke um, for cost-benefit analysis or, or anything else, I think we should recognize that there's still a lot that we don't know in terms of what we're actually measuring when we discuss well-being. Um, I think we have an increasingly clear sense of the various dimensions of well-being and which metrics measure each dimension. Um, but there's still an important dimension of well-being that falls into the economist's category of unobservables. Um, so well-being is driven by interactions between things that are observable um, such as socioeconomic and demographic traits, and others that are unobservable, such as character traits, genes, and other things that are much more difficult to measure. Um, and I think those interactions between what we can observe and what we don't observe um, are fundamental to what really constitutes well-being, and also to the related behavioral outcomes that we're trying to understand. In other words, I think some of the more interesting and newest research, which I'm um, also involved in is trying to understand what well-being causes. Does do the different dimensions of well-being have causal properties? Um, and there's some exciting new work trying to disentangle the genetic components of well-being from what's determined by the environment. Um, there's also experimental work which compares predicted well-being to actual choice behavior, some of the work that uh, Matt cited. Um, yet even in that work, there are still some questions about what is the it that we're actually trying to measure? Um, so, 
Income is much simpler to define if much less interesting, but well-being is big and complicated, and I think we really need to recognize that. Um, and I raise that because I think um, it, I'm not sure we can be as precise as these papers want us to be about the underlying concepts of well-being. And as such, I think that um, this more blunt-tooled approach, which seeks regularities in large-scale data sets and then even experiments and then teases out precise relationships underlying them, um, it may fall short of con the conceptual clarity that lawyers want us to have. But we're still trying to get, I think we're still trying to get real answers to what these concepts mean. OK, so with that sort of cautionary note, I would, I, would, I would also say that there's a lot of consensus among economists and psychologists um, that well-being has two distinct and measurable dimensions, hedonic and evaluative, and these have been highlighted in the papers. Um, and indeed, the question of whether we should be including, which, which dimension, hedonic or evaluative, we should be measuring in our national statistics is the question that um, we are tasked with in this National Academies panel, where we're trying to make a recommendation about what the US should be doing in terms of measuring well-being. Um, so the hedonic dimension of well-being, which um, the first paper very much endorses, and which I've characterized as Benthamite, um, a rogue economist using philosopher's terms is usually not a good thing, but there you go, um, is very much related to the environment or context that people live in, the quality of their jobs, their immediate state of health, the nature of their commute to work, the nature of their social networks. Um, and it's primarily reflected in positive, negative, and affective states, and we have good questions to capture this for the most part. Um, and we also find that daily experience does have linkages to long-term health status, heart disease, other things, um, via channels such as worry and stress on the one hand and pleasure and enjoyment on the other. Um, so we can even say that there are certain things about hedonic well-being where we can establish causal, causal linkages or at least strong correlations with, with outcomes that we care about. And, and then evaluative well-being is, is basically how people think about and evaluate their lives as a whole. Um, and it reflects a more global life course view. And I, it's likely also related to longer term behaviors, such as investments in health and education. When you invest in your health or your education or your children's education, you're thinking over a much longer time horizon about your life as a whole, about their lives. Um, and this dimension of well-being, which I've also roughly categorized as Aristotelian, again, tromping in philosopher's territories, um, implicitly encompasses a eudaimonic component, such as the extent of purpose and meaning that people derive from their jobs, their relationships, and their lives. Um, in my view, it's this evaluative, and particularly the eudaimonic dimension of well-being that's inherently related to the opportunities that people have to exercise and to pursue fulfilling lives. And this, make, this is a much broader dimension of well-being um, that um, is arguably much more complicated to understand, but I think is really essential if we're thinking about human well-being in a deeper sense. Um, and in some empirical work um, of mine and also some others, Kahneman and Deaton, it's, it's, it's really coming out that the dimension of well-being that respondents emphasize or value most may be mediated by their agency and capacity to control their own lives. So there's this recent paper by Kahneman and Deaton in Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences, which I was a reviewer on, I'll confess, um, which finds that income correlates much more closely with evaluative well-being than with hedonic well-being. So hedonic well-being and income, the correlation tapers off at roughly median income, 75K. But the correlation with evaluative well-being goes all the way up the income ladder. So why is this? Well, after a certain point, more income can't make people have enjoy their daily lives more, um, have better moods, smile more. Um, but insufficient income is clearly linked to suffering and negative moods. But I think it's these. I, I think the higher income findings aren't necessarily saying, well, more and more income make people more and more happier. It's that these higher levels of income offer people many more choices about how to live and what to do with their lives. So people with more income have more choices. And that's related to higher evaluative scores, because they can choose what they want to do with their lives. If they want to become billionaires, they can. If they want to become musicians, if they want to be lawyers, whatever. Um, but it all. I think that's what that income differential finding is, is uncovering. 
Similarly, Eduardo Lora and I found in Latin America that the most important variables to the reported life satisfaction of the poor, is people below median income, not really poor, but we call them poor, is after having enough food to eat, is friends and family to rely on at times of need. Versus the most important variable to the well-being of the rich, which is again people above median income, was their health and their work. So you could conclude that the wealthy people in Latin America are greedy jerks and they don't care about their friends and family. Or you could conclude that their work and their health is what allows them the opportunity to control their own lives. And friends and family for the poor are a safety net because there aren't any other alternatives. Um, so again, I think the dimension of well-being is, is very much that people care about or emphasize is, is mediated by what they're capable of. Um, individuals who focus primarily on daily experiences due to low expectations, lack of agency, or imposed social norms um, may have less incentive to invest in the future. Um, indeed, in rapidly growing developing countries, uh, Matt referenced this work, I find lower levels of reported evaluative well-being among respondents with high income levels and high mobility than among poor rural respondents with no mobility and no future prospects. Um, I have some similar findings on obesity in the U.S. and how that's mediated um, by how, what the obesity norm is in the cohort. I, I won't go into those just because of time. But it seems in a lot of different results I'm finding that people are better able to adapt to unpleasant certainty and retain relatively high levels of well-being and likely higher in the hedonic well-being dimension than in the evaluative dimension than to live with uncertainty, even that which is associated with progress. Um, and so, and then individuals who have a longer term focus and are more achievement oriented, meanwhile, may at times sacrifice daily experience, hedonic well-being, for longer term objectives and anticipated evaluative well-being in the future. Think about second year law students when you think about this, right? Um, and the extreme manifestation of this is those who choose to migrate to another country to provide their children with opportunities or to participate in social unrest for a broader societal objective. They are certainly not thinking about their hedonic well-being when they're pursuing those activities. But they have other goals in mind, which relate a lot to their life purpose and their life evaluations. Um, in some new work on um, migration data, everybody always finds that migrants are less happy than non-migrants in their place of destination. Well, we looked at this and find it's actually people who intend to migrate from Latin America are less happy before they go, even though they're more educated and wealthier. So they're frustrated achievers. OK, I'm going to try and do this in a minute. Um, OK, I mentioned that uh, this work on the causal dimensions of well-being is quite, um, is really kind of where the field is going. Um, and I think the two dimensions may have different causal properties. Um, and then my own research on happy peasants versus frustrated achievers is relevant here. Again, people who live unpleasant daily experiences to, to get out of poverty, right? And they may be unhappy during the process of change. And the, can I get 30 seconds to discuss the gender puzzle he talked about that doesn't count on my time? OK. Oh, no, no, no. Because Matt mentioned this gender finding by Stevenson and Walfers, right? That women's happiness was declining in the US. Well, it turns out. An updated version of that work finds that it's now evened out. And that car, there's a Swiss study that finds similar findings. So the process of change and changing expectations, changing norms in the short term is often associated with lower levels of at least hedonic well-being and maybe even evaluative well-being. And then it switches. OK, let me try and say a couple quick words about the papers because I'm clearly running out of time. Um, I thought Matt's criticisms of economists' lack of attention to normative concepts and clarity was a good one, and we should learn from it. Um, the one thing, though, that I, I disagree with, I, I agreed with a lot, um, is that, um, it, that experience quality measures are the only ones we can use for policy because we know the most about them. Because in the end, they're limited to daily experience, and they're missing precisely the gray and unknown area that is what, in the end, well-being metrics can help us better understand about human welfare. This is the whole role of purpose, life purpose, achievement, goals, other than just happiness in the daily sense, I think is captured by evaluative well-being. We need to know more about it. But I wouldn't throw out that baby with the bathwater, because I think it's 
the cutest baby in the room. Um, so, and then even in Matt's paper, he refers to Mr. Cherry and Mr. Grumpy, and it speaks to that same point. Um, I won't go into the, the methodological fixes on scale heterogeneity and stuff like that. I can in the questions, but I'm running out of time. Um, and then just a last thing on, I, I really liked on the, the John, Chris, and Jonathan paper, um, I think they're, I think that I agree with their sort of criticisms of CBA and saying that well-being is actually looking at these choices in real time in a more realistic sense and saying, you know, how much would you willi be willing to pay, be paid not to be hit by an asteroid, hypothetical example, that well-being metrics have a lot to offer. I also agree with them that it's really pretty difficult to manipulate well-being surveys because um, if it, with a properly designed survey, you're not asking people, will being hit by an asteroid make you unhappy? You're comparing people that were hit by an asteroid and hit, hit people who weren't. weren't. And they never knew that you were comparing the asteroid thing, right? So, but then, but I, I, I disagree um, that forecasting and discounting errors um, in contingency evaluations are resolved by well-being metrics because I don't think we really have a good handle on the intertemporal dimensions of well-being. Um, for example, when you ask somebody about their lives as a whole, are they thinking about their lives, their children's lives? You know, there, there are lots of things we don't know. Again, we can find out with research, but we don't know that yet. Um, and then lastly, um, I, I would like to see more in the paper about why they think um, experience well-being is so much better than evaluative well-being. I realize you guys have written about it elsewhere, but for somebody that doesn't know your earlier work, you know, it's, it's rather puzzling. Anyway, I learned a great deal from a lot of the papers, and I think it would be great if lawyers and economists talked more about this stuff in the future. Excellent. Jennifer, you're on the clock. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, so I'm Jennifer Hawkins. I'm a philosopher here at Duke. Um, and I wanted to say, so I learned a lot from these papers. They were very interesting. I've been interested for a while, even before reading... Um, Matt's paper, in thinking about what the relationship between philosophical approaches to well-being and more practically oriented uses of the concept and should be or needs to be. Um, because you often hear, um, or at least I do, as being in the field I am, they claim that there needs to be more dialogue, that um, uh, empirically minded folks working on well-being need to know more philosophical distinctions. Uh, which, of course, is one thing that, that Matt wants to say. And as a philosopher, I'm you know, happy if more people know what I work on. It's really, I find it fascinating. But I often wonder um, how much uh, needs to cross that line. What, what is most essential, really? Um, where do, it, it really forces you to think about where differences in theories of well-being make a practical difference in how we would measure welfare. Um, now, having said that, that's a big topic, and I'm only going to make one small point <laughs> on that front. Um, hopefully, I'll have the opportunity to think more about this as time goes on. Um, so, one of the things, um, one of the things that Matt focuses on very early in his paper um, is a distinction which he defines as the distinction between experientialist theories of well-being and non-experientialist theories of well-being. Um, some philosophers have called this state of the world theories versus state of mind. There are different ways of putting it. I'll just use his terminology. Um, and I'll, let me remind you briefly what it is supposed to amount to. Um, an experientialist theory is not just, I mean, it might be a theory that says that what makes you, your life go well is positive experience, but it's really not so much about the positive, but about restricting the things that count to your mental states. So, Whatever happens uh, around you, unless it somehow or other enters your experience, you become aware of it in some way, an experientialist is going to say it doesn't matter right, to your welfare because all that matters is what you know, feel, see, think. Things have to enter your mind in order to affect how well off you are. Um, and the um, you can just... These are contrived examples somewhat, but they may, again, I, philosophers are often ridiculed for using contrived examples, but sometimes they're just trying to make a very simple point. So if hypothetically you had two people who, for whatever, however it came to be, they had identical mental states, um, but one, and one, the first person 
uh, very much wants to be, um, to have good friends and to be well respected by colleagues. And let's say of this person that that's actually the case. The second person has the same desire um, and the same beliefs. Oh, and the first person also believes that this to be the case, and the second person does as well. But in this case, the person is deceived. Actually, their friends, you know, they don't really have very good friends. Most of their friends are, you know, conning them in one way or another, trying to get something from them. Um, and although they think that they're respected by their colleagues, they're actually not. Okay. The main point is just that um, non-experientialists are going to say that the person who is deceived, uh, who, for whom things are not as they think, is actually having a worse life. Things are going worse for him than for the other person. And an experientialist is going to say, unless he learns about it, unless it changes something about how he perceives the world, it makes no difference. All that matters is what he knows. Okay. Now, I have to admit, this distinction is one that I often find um, people having a lot of, especially non-philosophers having a lot of trouble with and wondering whether it really matters and, and grappling with it. How if it doesn't, if it's something you never know, if it's something that doesn't enter your experience, how can you possibly think that it makes a difference to well-being? And I'm not going to try to take up that issue today or convince you one way or another. I think it's a, it can, with a little motivation, become an interesting topic. Um, but I have to admit that having thought more about it, um, at least on that topic, I've come to the conclusion there's very little practical relevance to this debate. And, um, and so that's what I'd like to explain here. Now, uh, Adler thinks that it is an important distinction, but there are a couple different things he might mean in that. He might mean that, you know, in some important level, we need to engage with the philosophical theories and that distinction as it plays out in different theories of well-being. More modestly, he might mean something that, like, people working across disciplines and in these fields as we develop new methods need to be aware of some of the assumptions that guided the development of um, cost-benefit analysis and methods that rely on preferences. You certainly have to know what these people mean when they're talking about preference realization and that it's, for them, a state of the world. That's a more modest claim. It doesn't say you really have to get into the nitty-gritty of figuring out which view is correct. It's the second thing that I doubt. I don't think we really need to get into the issue of whether experientialism or non-experientialism is the better account. To make my point, I think it's actually helpful to describe two theories of well-being that are very similar. Uh, more similar than the ones that um, Adler discusses, and that really just differ on this point. So um, let me put forward one I'll just call the happiness theory, right? It would just be a view that says, look, uh, your life is going well to the extent that you're happy. If you're happy, you get more happy, it's going better. You get less happy, it's going worse. Pretty straightforward. It says that that's all that matters, right? So how well you're doing is purely a function of that mental state. Now. I'm going to complicate the picture. Let's introduce a theory that I'll call happiness plus. Um, it's been inspired by a view that's actually much more complicated and has been defended by um, the philosopher uh, L.W. Sumner. But I'm just going to make, give a simple version of it. So imagine now that we say what happens is that, uh, that how well you're doing depends on two things. It's partly a function of how happy you are. You certainly have to be happy to be doing well on happiness plus. But there's an additional requirement, which is that your happiness not be based on false beliefs. If you're happy, but you have, your happiness is, depends on all these you know, false assumptions, and if it, therefore it were true that were you to learn these things, you would suddenly be unhappy, then even now, though you are happy, you're less well off to some degree, how we work out the details is important, less well off now than you think you are. And the best case scenario is where you are happy and your happiness is based on true beliefs. You don't have to have any view of whether you think that's a good theory, a bad theory, whatever. The main point is just that it's a happiness, it has a, it's a theory that places a huge amount of emphasis on happiness, but it's a non-experientialist theory in Matt's terminology. It's a theory that, set, that allows there to be a condition that affects the outcome of what we say, how, you, how you're well you're doing, and that condition is something that is non-mental. And therefore, it's also something you could fail to know about or not. Why do I think this doesn't matter a whole lot? Basically, 
suppose that for whatever reason, um, and it doesn't matter, you could do this with other theories that would be similar too. Suppose we accept, we're interested in happiness and we're trying to decide between being people who adopt the happiness theory or the happiness plus theory. And in particular, we want to know if it's going to make a difference to our empirical work, whether which one is correct. Suppose we are pretty confident that we can gain um, data about happiness and a bit of a stretch. Suppose we could also gain data about the extent to which people's happiness depends on false beliefs, which I don't know how you would do that, but suppose you could. Then the question would be, um, feeding this data into your two theories, does about, say, a particular group, do you get different answers about how well off individuals are doing or different answers about how well off the group is doing? Well, you might at the individual level in a few cases, because there may be some people who are um, their level of happiness depends hugely upon uh, false beliefs. But the kinds of things that are greatly significant to most people, and of course most people's happiness doesn't depend on just one thing, right? It depends on lots of things. Most of the things that affect our happiness are things that we have reasonably decent epistemic access to. It's not going to turn out across large groups of people, probably, that the two theories yield radically different results in terms of how well the group is doing. It may make a difference at the individual level. And it's an interesting question why we would, you know, why we, some people think this, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't think that this is a particular divide that matters a whole lot from the practical standpoint. And so although I find it philosophically interesting, um, when I encounter types, and believe me, I have, um, you know, uh, social science types who want to laugh at the discussion, especially, I think it's something about Nozick's experience machine example draws forth ridicule from non-philosophers, and I can see why. It's a pretty extreme example. But the point is, I'm not going to waste my breath trying to convince them that they need to um, read Nozick or appreciate him or understand the example, because I don't really think that's the key thing we should be discussing um, when we're trying to get straight about the basics of well-being for moving forward in the practical sphere. Yeah. A much more important distinction um, may be that between, say, you know, a hedonic experience and evaluative experience. Because, and it may be interesting questions about which methods are actually going to get at that. Um, even if you think, um, well, I'll, I'll wind up. But I think that the questions about whether it, what matters is your evaluative attitude towards your life or how you feel may be much more important to wrestle with than experientialism versus not. Peter. Hi, I'm Peter Eubel, and uh, for the purposes of this conversation, I'm going to use the words law, psychology, economics, uh, and philosophy interchangeably. <laughs> Is that that's okay, Matt? Okay. Just we just need to clear our, clarify our terms before we start. That's all that matters. All right. All right. So I'm a, I'm a physician. Um, survived an undergraduate philosophy degree. Actually, very happy I got it. Um, and then with a background. Um, besides in clinical medicine, uh, background in bioethics and uh, behavioral economics. And I've done a lot of research over the years on how, on uh, unconscious and irrational forces that influence the way people make decisions. And from that research, I tend to be, be a preference skeptic. Uh, on the other hand, I also am someone who knows that we need to have information to guide policy. So uh, we can't find perfect information on preferences, um, but we have to make some decisions. So I want to just tell you about a couple Studies I do, one I'll just uh, clarify a little or add a little bit of detail from what Matt discussed. And I'll highlight why I am basically don't think either cost-benefit analysis or well-being analysis are perfect. And uh, that, that forces us, I think, if we're not going to be able to come up with, up with one number to guide policy, like the result of a specific analysis, they can, and a threshold number that makes the policy good or bad, that if we're not going to have that, we're left with making difficult judgments, and frankly, I'm not enough of a policy wonk to know how we do that, and I really want to throw that out to people. So let me just tell you about a couple studies um, I've conducted. Um, one is the one that Matt referred to, um, where we uh, surveyed patients who have colostomy. So that means that they essentially, their colon ends in the side of their abdomen, and they poop into a pouch. It's a pretty icky thing. To, to consider having in your life, but yet the people who have colostomies emotionally adapt to this very rapidly. And in the matter of months, um, they do quite well. Uh, and and by, by that, I mean in terms of their emotional day-to-day -day lives. 
And, um, but when you ask someone with that colostomy, and this is what the part of the study that Matt talked about, uh, hey, how much would you give up to no longer have a colostomy? They give up substantial amounts. Um, and I do think that that's part of a, a, a general truth, is that people care, I do think they care about more than just their moment to moment mood. Now, um, I'm gonna get back to that point in a second though, because I don't think people are aware of how their circumstances influence their moment to moment moods either, so I wanna get back to that. Um, but the second thing is in that same study, we went to people who used to have colostomies and asked them, hey, how much would you give up you know, to, no long, to not have to go back and have a colostomy again? And they gave an answer that was identical to that of the general public. They basically, so they'd gone through this experience. Um, at that time, had emotionally adapted to it, probably. Um, they knew what it was like to have a colostomy, but when they finally got reconnected, so there are some people who get this colostomy, and then when they heal enough inside, they get their bowels reconnected. They couldn't, they couldn't imagine being more miserable than they were back then. And this is a real uh, challenge. Um, I don't think... I mean, one of the differences I see between cost benefit analysis and well-being analysis is one is more about revealed preferences of the decisions people make, one's more after things happen to people, how do they experience them. I think we're, they're both kind of messy, right? Uh, if you look at um, the study we did in pa patients who were waiting for kidney transplants, we asked them to, to predict, hey, what do you think your life would be like after a successful transplant? It really sucks to have kidney failure, by the way. You go into dialysis a few times a week, you have about a 20% annual mortality rate, you're really sick. Uh, they imagined an incredible improvement in their lives following a transplant. Uh, and almost every domain that we met then assessed them, they improved much less than they thought. So they mispredicted what it would be like. I mean, it's hard to know in advance what life is going to be like with, um, necessarily when you go through a change. But then when we took them a year after the transplant and measured their quality of life again and saw how much they'd improved, which was less than they thought, we then also said, hey, what was your quality of life like before you had the transplant? And now they remembered it being way worse than it actually was. So experience doesn't always teach us about how our circumstances have influenced our well-being. And so it makes it a challenge. It's why when it comes to these well-being measures, the ones I'm a bigger fan of, are the moment-to-moment -moment measures that just say how you're feeling right now, because I think that's as accurate as we can get. And then it leaves us with mood data. And, and I do think, on average, people, all else equal, often want to maximize the level of positive mood and minimize the level of negative mood. But I also think they value many other things in their lives besides that. And I, having raised two kids, I'll tell you, uh, Matt was absolutely right. You know, you're not going to improve your moment-to-moment -moment moods, or for that matter, your marital satisfaction by having little kids in the house. But you will probably maximize your sense of meaning and purpose in life. And that's, that's a value to people. So, so I don't think we have, can find one good number, I don't think. So now the question is, how do you make a decision? Um, and I, I, I'd love to see more of a jury model where we, let's say, have some policy we have to look at, and we've got cost-benefit data on it, and we have you know, well-being uh, data estimates on it, and we, have other, and we have maybe a couple philosophers around there, and we tell them, please stay away from Nozick's machine for a while, but talk about, you know. <laughs> Uh, and and we, we debate it out, and we just say, how do you, which of these numbers matter most in this circumstance? I don't know if we did that enough times for enough kinds of policies, whether we generate some general guidelines about how to make use of what are very different kinds of data. Um, but frankly, I'm not sure what the alternative is, and having not been around the table when these numbers are generated and how they're used in policies, or maybe as we were hearing a little earlier, rejected in policies, I don't know what'll work. So that's really my thoughts, and I will cede the rest of my time. All right, so I want, to, <laughs> I want to ask one question, especially for the last two years, and then I want to get the papers on it. But just for the last two years, you could, um, in particular, although all three of you should feel free to answer this, but given the constraint that was earlier identified, which is policymakers are going to feel a need to be told, here is the relevant input. So it's all great, you know, deliberation day, great. Never gonna happen, right? So all, all you know, we'll have a jury of our peers. We'll have a, you know, we'll have transparency. We'll have a bunch of people sitting around singing kumbaya. It's never gonna happen, right? So, it, it, as a matter of political economy, you have to actually put a stake in the ground. I know you, I, you just said you don't want to. I know that, but I want to. Well, I'm, I'm definitely against singing kumbaya. Okay. <laughs> but I'm, I'm interested in particular if, if if the question comes to you. Let's let's pause it, and I will pause this that we are not going to successfully have some sort of collaborative process 
I'm the decision maker. You, you need to tell me what measurement I want to use. I'm just wondering if, 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 if you all were just mistaken and going to say what measurement that would be, and then I want to get them in the conversation. Um, um, so in the real world, is how often does one measure drive policy when when politics gets you know oh, added oh, to the mix? I mean, imagine that you are advising the new head of OIRA, so they're going to be mm -hmm. doing some sort of analysis that right now is called benefit cost or cost benefit analysis. And imagine that under the rubric, you can actually put a whole lot of different considerations in because it's true they they can't put a whole lot of considerations in. And you're, so you're advising. I just want to know if you have to put the stake in the ground. But again, so that number, I don't understand. I'm not a law person, right? I don't even know what OIRA stands for. But um, when you take that number, what happens to it? What, what's done with it? it regulations are, are, are accepted or sent back. Based solely on that number? No. No. The, the law drives. The law drives. I, I just said, is that not based solely on that number? But we all. But we so if all it's not based that. solely on that number, I would say give me, give me two numbers then. And let them whatever judgment then is following up and how they use that one number. Why do you force me into one number when it's not even ended up determining policy? Only because I'm, I'm only trying to figure out if you had to do it. You, okay, I mean. No, no, but, you, you feel free. To, I, I, I'm only trying because we're having a whole lot of discussion about different kinds of things, mm -hmm. and I just want to try to get a sense if you had to have a stake in the ground, you can you can feel free. Yeah, but oh, okay, sorry. sorry. Well, it was not a philosophical point, but. You know, GNP, which everybody's saying, oh, no, we're going to. GNP is, underlying GNP it are about a million numbers, mm -hmm. which the composition of which changes all the time. There's a great deal of debate. So, why are we pushing for well being to be one fixed number based mm -hmm. on one metric when, just like GNP, there's a lot of debate about what the different metrics tell us and how they relate to each other? And if you really feel compelled to sum them up into an index, which most of the people in the science of this think is a very bad idea, I guess you could do that. But it, it would then be meaningless from the perspective of the science, and then make for bad policy. Right. Well, I mean, I know well, I'm not sure I really want to take a <laughs> come down on either side. Um, I have a lot of worry. I, I'm really interested in the subjective well-being research, but I have a lot of worries about using it for policy now, and I just don't know where it's gonna go. Um, I do think, I, li I really like the, um, the ex post, <laughs> the ex ante ex post aspect, because I'm very, very persuaded that people really don't know what they want a lot of times, or what it's going to, what getting what they want will entail. Um, but uh, on the other hand, there are, just, you know, the similar problems with trying to, as Peter said, you get just, just mood data in, in some cases, and, I'm, and people care about more than that. So I, it seems to me like you're gonna have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis, what kind of policy, what kind of data. In some cases you may want to use two types, some cases you may want to use one. I don't think we can have a, a cross the board. Okay, now we're just gonna use subjective well-being data. <laughs> or now we're going to go with cost-benefit analysis. There's so many different levels and types of policy. Yeah, I just, uh, so I've been doing regulatory analysis for something like 30 years, so I, I want to, um, and I think this is important for, you know, doing well-being analysis or benefit-cost analysis to understand that, um, first of all, um, if you look at all the executive orders that you guys were talking about, um, they're very clear, the statute rules. Um, so there are many times when something gets put into place that is not benef cost beneficial, but um, has to be done because of the way that the law reads. Um, there's also um, a very good piece by Don Arbuckle, who used to be, who was a senior career person at OMB for something like 30 years on uh, um, how analysis and policy and politics mix in the White House. And basically he says, politics win. Um, but there's some other pieces of this that I think are more subtle, which is, um, I'm not sure whether I'm proud of this or not, but I think the work that I've done has killed more rules um, than um, saved them. And, but you guys will never know about that, because it kills them in the development stage before they get to OMB, before they become public. Because I think the most important part of benefit-cost analysis, and I think this would be true for well-being analysis too, is that it makes you start poking at things um, and saying, wait a minute, will this really work the way that I think it will? Um, so I think, I think that's the strongest case for any type of analytic framework is that it makes you start asking questions and collecting data. 
Jennifer. Can I just add to that real quick? So just to add, you know, more texture. I know we're kind of, you know, prefiguring some of the panel discussion that we might have as well. But I mean, you know, the executive orders have also been clear that cost-benefit analysis is both qualitative and quantitative measures, right? So in one way to understand cost-benefit analysis would very much, you know, be open to, to incorporating a lot of these measures. And I think this was Jonathan Wiener's point as well. And then um, maybe I'll just take this opportunity too to just a friendly qualifier to um, Matt's earlier point about the institutional sort of dimensions to this. Um, that, you know, Circular A4, I mean, I think one way to think about it um, is um, this is the, the main document sort of governing within the executive branch, you know, the, the Office of Information Rental Affairs of Wires kind of uh, coordination of the review of these rules, um, itself is a kind of constrained pluralism in the sense that it calls, I mean, it's not just John Graham, you know, post wire. I mean, Circular A4 also says present both cost-benefit analysis and cost-effectiveness measures. And um, so I think to sort of, uh, you know, yeah, and distribution analysis as well, right? So, I mean, the, the, the process itself is very pluralistic, and I think it's transparently um, so and, and, and recognizes it, I mean, with, with a lot of qualifiers that we might, we might talk about later. Well, let me, instead of a response from some of, uh, sorry, DBM was now saying a lot too. Let me just, the, the point of my question in, in, in many ways was actually to tee them up in this sense. Of course it's true, some statutes don't allow for cost benefit. But for those that do, of course it's true that OIRA can use a lot of it. The question is, well, would we actually recommend theirs? Right? So it, the, to, the, to put the question a little more sharply, but then I'll, I'll let them jump in. So there's lots of different ideas out there. They are suggesting a reorientation. And so as, you know, the question for the panelists for anybody is, is that a real, if, if you were in fact head of OIRA, would you say, look, I know it's in its infancy, I know there's more to be done. But this is the way I want to go. So in a way, the question is asking is, what level of persuasion do you have from them? But I will let you all then. I can answer that. Can you tell your befuddled panelists yes. what OIRA is? Because <laughs> oh, sorry. No. Um, by, uh, by regulatory, regulatory something. Oh, oh, so so it's what So by uh, executive order, uh, the of, Executive Office of the President reviews pending or, or proposed as well as pending regulations and engages in a uh, benefit cost analysis where the statute allows it and by the way only mandated for executive agencies but OIRA is a huge player in the regulatory world so um, its methodology is of enormous interest and there are big battles over exactly what the wording of each new executive order is going to be although they haven't changed much in the last uh, in the last quarter century, but I'm simply <laughs> noting they are ones who engage in this analysis, and so the only reason I was asking the question was I really thought I'd say is team them up for the question of well, how far would you go in trying to reorient one way that this that this analysis is so going to be prominent? So, so when, if they had they had replaced Cass Sunstein, would they be put would they put numbers down? You would this be the numbers they'd use? Well, be right. And just just for the benefit of those who don't know, so when, so so when. A year ago, the greenhouse gas regulations were rejected. Yeah. That rejected rejection came in the form of a memorandum from Cass Sunstein that was then, you know, sort of routed through. Anyway. Okay, this is great. Um, <laughs> first of all, I love this panel so much. Thank you so much for everything <laughs> all of you said. Um, fantastic. Couldn't be happy. Um, okay, so to try to answer these questions, these specific questions. Um, we definitely do not believe that, what should, that the way policy should be made is that you should do well-being analysis for everything and just make policy in accord with what well-being analysis says you should do. Uh, for example, even if all you cared about is happiness, and we, it is not all we care about, uh, maximizing overall happiness would not take into consideration distributional effects. So you know, it might be that what creates overall greatest happiness is to maximize the happiness of some people and to you know kill off lots of other people. I mean, practically, that wouldn't be the case. But even if it were the case, we wouldn't want that. So you know, what we want is for these subjective well-being measures to be one input, which sounds like it's compatible with present law and with what the vast majority of people here seem to think. Now, what would we actually do? Since we're kind of more persuaded about the usefulness of the subjective well-being measures than, than maybe the median person would be, or 
even more persuaded, sure, it would get probably more weight if we were running OIRA than it would if somebody else were running OIRA. But I think that the basic, less controversial argument is that it should get some weight. All right, now the, uh, that, that was my invention. Now, uh, that, all right, let me um, yeah, thank you all. Uh, I, I, I question, if we time later for uh, Peter, but I want to ask a question to uh, both Jenny and Carol. In a way, I think your points are really close and really important. So, um, Jenny says in a way to me, okay, fine, Adler, you have this uh, thing, preferences, and we'll see that people can have preferences for external attributes like health and you know, not being deceived and good friendships and so forth. Um, and uh, the true measure of that is preference utility, such that preference utility is in part influenced by these external things. But your challenge is, you know, isn't there a kind of experiential measure, um, uh, 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 you know, that is uh, um, an indicator of someone's mental state, which is a really good proxy for preference utility, right? It is, you know, uh, uh, just as good as preference utility, except that it doesn't wash out false beliefs. What would that measure be? Let's ask people, to what extent do you believe your preferences are satisfied? Right? That's an experience. I mean, this is your point. That's yeah. an experience for matter. Right? Because it's now not a question about what happens out there in the world. It's a question about your beliefs. So instead of asking people, I mean, this is your challenge, right? Instead of asking people, uh, you know, about, I mean, that is, I take an easy target, Apex, and feeling satisfaction, but your challenge should be, well, instead of, um, you know, trying to directly operationalize preference utility, simply ask people about the extent to which they believe their preferences are, are realized, wouldn't that be a pretty good proxy? Because unless we think that people are systematically deceived, that, you know, a class, one class of beneficiaries is more likely to be deceived than another, um, okay. this is going to be a pretty good indicator, and, a, and an experiential kind of indicator or proxy for preference utility. And that indeed is exactly where Carol was going, because EWB is just that. Right? EWB is the extent to which people evaluate uh, how people evaluate their lives. As people are asked something like, you know, how, how well do you think your life is going? Now that question um, looks very much like a question which says to people, to what extent do you think your preferences are realized? And as you say, what's nice about that is that that can take account of people evaluating their lives as being better because of having more income or better health and so forth and not just affects. So my question, this is really for Carol. So I think these are, this is an important challenge. That is, if one is in my camp, not your camp, but my camp, of thinking that the best metric is preference utility, it might be that my skepticism about SWB measures is too strong because this is kind of EWB belief about preference utility measure, which is pretty good. So my question really for Carol then is, well, my worry there is systematic recalibration. The worry would be that, yes, people... Um, can be asked, how well do you think your life is going in, on some numerical scale? But if there is not just random, but systematic recalibration of that. So it's not just that, for example, when the weather is better, people get higher numbers, because that's going to be just an error term and a regression. But rather that, for example, as people are healthier or have higher income, they use a different scale to express EWB. That is then a problem for this proposal. So then my question for Carol is, well, what do we know about EWB? What do we know? I mean, you talked about sort of the extent to which EWB correlates with the kinds of things that people might care about, like income and you know, job opportunities and so forth. But what do we know about the extent to which EWB measures are recalibrated as people move up the scale? Um, OK, well, it's, it, that's a great question. It's, it's, I, don't, I don't know how much they are recalibrated as as people move up the scale because, I mean, there seems to be systematic patterns in terms of the characteristics of people that score higher and score lower. And there are also different questions that, that capture this more precisely. For example, how does your life compare to the best possible life, which is a question in the Gallup Daily and the Gallup World Poll, the question in that Kahneman and Deaton paper that I cite. That's slightly different than just open-ended, how are you feeling about your life as a whole? And so what we find in some work we did comparing answers to these questions was that affective questions, smiling yesterday, whatever, correlated the least with income and other kind of socioeconomic traits. Life satisfaction higher than those, but not anywhere near as high as 
the best possible life question. And in fact, the, the Walfers and Stevenson work challenging the Easterland paradox has a lot to do with what question you use. So if you do the same scatter plot, the same countries, and you use life satisfaction versus best possible life, you get a much steeper and more linear relationship with income with best possible life. So that's not a perfect answer, but it's saying that we're starting to get at these differences. And it, and it strikes me that um, I don't know how much people really recalibrate the scale as they have more of these things. It's, it's, what, it's how you phrase the question. If you ask them how their life compares to the best possible life, people that have more of these great things like health and income and purpose and meaning know their life is a lot better than somebody that has a worse life. Or they believe it. Or they believe it. Not right, as huge. So, I, mean, yeah. I mean, that's huge. Right. Because, because they, part of what you have, it. you have two things going on at the same time. One is you're more clearly anchoring a scale, right. which seems to be good. Right. But the other is you're priming people. I mean, that's what, you know, psychologists talk about. You put an idea in their head. So if all of a sudden you're telling them what the best possible life and they think, oh, I guess that must be those really rich people I've heard about who live out what in the Western part of the world. I mean, no, they can affect it. So we did a survey once. We, we called people up on the phone and they, had, they were Parkinson's patients. And we said to them, hey, how happy are you? And we got a certain set of answers. Uh, we said, well, we're calling from the University of Pennsylvania. How happy are you? Right. Uh, the other one, we said, we're calling from the Movement Disorders Clinic at the University of Pennsylvania. How happy are you? And we got different answers, because all of a sudden we put Parkinson's back in their head. And especially the people with mild Parkinson's, it, we reminded them about their disease, and then they, they did worse. So we... Yeah, I, we have a similar... I, yeah. We've got a similar experience right along those lines. We did the first pilot survey of well-being in Afghanistan, right, without going into the details of why it's not, you know, full national survey. But we found that people in Afghanistan smiled more yesterday than people in Cuba, as hmm. much as la the Latin American average. If you think about the conditions in Afghanistan versus those in Latin America, that's cuckoo. Yeah. They scored higher than the world average on open-ended how happy are you in general. When we asked them the best possible life question, yeah. they score way lower. Wow. That's Put great. some sort of where they would be on the country yeah. scatter plot, mm -hmm. right? Well, I mean, so to me, to me that, but here's yeah. the worry. The worry is that if best possible life itself is rescaled as people move up in terms of development, then we have the worry. And so I'd like to know that. But that is, so to what extent, if we, if we ask this kind of cancel ladder question to people in the same society at different stages of development, so you know, transparently, I mean, I mean, it seems to me that people might reasonably might prefer to have more income and liberty and so forth because these are all purpose means. But if we observe a kind of Easterling effect with respect to that measure, notwithstanding you know GDP development, then that that would be a real worry in terms of using EW. As a but we but we don't. With best possible yeah, life, you you really get much more relationship with income. And some of the work we're doing now is also um, trying to tease out how these scores compares with how much people value opportunity to choose what they can do with their life, with freedom to do what they can do with their life, and a couple of other things that kind of assess capabilities and agency. It's very new stuff, so I can't. I mean, the, the other issue would be cardinality versus ordinality. So the, the correlation shows it's ordinal, but there's a scale of compression work, right? You want the cardinal scale, you don't want the top points compressed in, you want them to express genuine differences. So it might be this moving up, but not enough. You, right? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I, I, I've thought a lot about that. I, I agree that, you know, a 1 to 3 scale is ridiculous because everybody scores 2, and, you know, a 1 to 10 score is probably better. But should we have a 1 to 50 score? I mean, there is sort of a bell curve distribution of these responses that kind of, even if you had a much bigger scale, you know, there are just not that many people that will put themselves in the very highest, you know, and so you'd be comparing, you know, bunching... 17, 18, and 19, and comparing them to 7 and 8, essentially. I mean, I don't think the scale issues are, you can just completely dismiss them, but I do think that there is, at some level, of just regularities in the distribution of responses that suggest that there aren't all these people that will still continue to try and score higher and higher. Thank you. This was uh, really fantastic. I completely agree with John. Uh, a lot of fun. Um, Carol, you told us to think more about how time affects well-being. Uh, and I think that that's entirely true, that we need to be careful about seeing well-being in uh, long-term uh, time horizons. Uh, but Peter's point, I think, in part, is a point that suggests brains aren't so good at that, right? So um, in a, his study of the colostomy patients suggests that this ex-ante, ex-post distinction really isn't the best one, what we really want is an ex-ante, ex-post. The thing we really need is the, the in the 
moment experience, right? That that's what people are good at providing, the in the moment experience, that when you ask them ex ante questions or when you ask them ex post questions, all of these other um, factors cloud their, their memory, their judgment, uh, and their decisions. So if that's the case, if there's a lot of truth in, in, in what Peter says in that respect, and if what we care about are not just those moments, but moments distributed over a long time, um, is the better approach to continue to use more moment-based measures but merely to think about them in long-term time horizons, mm -hmm. rather than to try to get at long-term time horizons via these evaluative measures, right? So, mm -hmm. so the question is, so, so you know, I think my sense is that your push is to use, you know, because we should care about long-term time horizons, moment-by-moment uh, -moment affect measures might be problematic because they seem too discrete. And maybe what we need to do is to care about evaluative measures that seem to make people reflect on long-term time horizons. But if people really aren't good at making those kinds of judgments and decisions for the reasons that Peter suggests, maybe do we get at the kinds of things that you're asking us to care about, and which we completely agree are hugely important, by making them focus on the moments and attempting to aggregate those moments over some longer horizon? Um, I, th yeah, I, 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 th I don't think I don't think sort of moments over time gets at the same thing as a long-term evaluative things, and it could. So I, I completely agree with, and, and I think Peter's work is fascinating about you know how people remember things or their ability to remember things and predict things, and there are all kinds of things that I mean we know consumers mispredict all kinds of things all the time, which is why I don't think consumption choice data is very good either. But mm -hmm. the, I think that the difference here is that. Um, <coughs> Longer term horizons are not just about, are, are distinct from how you feel at the moment, your mood at the moment, and even many moods over time. So, um, and, and, it, and achieving what you may want in this more purposeful, you know, preference satisfaction sense and that, just any way you want to put it, eudaimonic sense, may not be about good moods at all, right? It's like the little children example or, and 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 the more extreme examples are, you know, these people that intend to migrate, and then we're trying to look at their well-being levels after not just when they just arrived, but over time. Or something I found in in kind of aggregate macro stuff called the paradox of unhappy growth, which is that um, respondents in fast-growing, <coughs> developing countries in general are less happy than those in slower-growing countries. Even though over time, if you five years later. The levels of well-being in those countries, once, once growth is stabilized and some of the benefits even out and equalized and everything else, are report to be better off. That their experience, you know, their momentary experiences, which, which may be unpleasant, and yet the long-run outcome. But isn't is that a good just one. a? Isn't that just an argument for taking a bigger picture of the momentary experiences, right? Because I mean, why because ignore I don't those? Think the, because, well, like, I don't I think, think we, you should ignore momentary experiences. I think right, you but, need to understand them. And in fact, moment right. if momentary experiences are bad enough they're going to disrupt long-term goals. I mean, there's this great study by George Akerlof and Rachel Cranton on um, uh, the sort of the, the kids and gangs who get scholarships to go to Exeter and Andover and all this stuff. So they, they, go, they go to these fancy schools, but they, they, they're miserable there. So they go back to their gangs, but they've lost their identity as gang members. And so they, the whole thing's a big failure. And it's because the, the, the actual experience itself was so bad that whatever the long run objectives of the policy intervention were, didn't work. So I think we've got to understand mm -hmm. moment to moment experiences. I think we need to also understand what people's longer term horizons are. Um, I don't think we know well when people evaluate their lives as, the, as a whole if they're thinking about their life experience or their children's experience. You know, I can tell you how how you know my children do in life matters a great deal to how I think about my life as a whole. But you know, how do you measure that? I mean, we have a long way to go before we know that. But I, I, that is distinct from how I feel moment to moment. I, I sure. just think so. They're so, different but, but given a situation metrics. in which we want to care about both of those, but have different measures for them, and I, you know, certainly like your opinions and, and Peter's as well. Might we be better off, but because of the problems with some kinds of measures that might be limited with other kinds of measures, are there reasons, in some cases at least, to prefer a more moment-by-moment -moment affective measure to a more evaluative measure, even if we think it's asking a different kind of question? 
it, it just seems to me like there's two issues here. One is um, time, and one is affect versus evaluation. Yep. And it seems to me that you could try to um, gain information over time by returning to people and asking them. But asking them, um, since we know that people misremember their past and misremember how good or how bad things were, at each time ask people about something um, that, I mean, it might in some ways be influenced by their past, but we're not explicitly asking them to remember. Ask them an evaluative question now. Ask them how good do you think your life is. Maybe even prime them in terms of asking them about certain domains and then ask the general question. Then come back later in time, ask that. So then you get the time dealt with, but you're not focusing on just mood over time. You're asking an evaluative question over time. I, I don't see why you can't do that. So your reference to time is utterly apropos because we now managed to get ourselves back on the schedule. Yeah. So <laughs> we will have a nine and a half minute break and at 1.30 we will start at 1.30. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu. This is Duke University.